how is this business application leader reimagining the future of work to leapfrog its largest competitors? In my next episode of Ultimate Guide to Partnering, I interview an ecosystem leader who shares what her company is doing differently to be the best in the business and change the game in an industry dominated by its competitors. This is the Ultimate Guide to Partnering, the top partnership podcast. In this podcast, Vince Minzione, a proven partner sales executive, shares his mission to help leaders like you achieve your greatest results through successful partnering. And now your host, Vince Minzione. Welcome to, or welcome back to the Ultimate Guide to Partnering. I'm Vince Menzion, your host, and today I welcome Monique Hayward, Microsoft's business application partner ecosystem leader, shares the big vision Microsoft has for the future of work and how it's leveraging the power of its cloud and its immense commitment to its partners to lead the path forward. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed welcoming Monique Hayward. Before we dive into the interview, I'm happy to announce that PartnerTap has become a founding sponsor of Ultimate Guide to Partnering. I've been friends with the founders of PartnerTap for many years, and PartnerTap is the only partner ecosystem platform designed for the enterprise. Their technology makes it easy to align channel teams with automated account mapping, letting you control what data you share while building a partner revenue engine. I'm so excited to have them on board. Be on the lookout for events, content, and more. And I'm so excited to continue working together in our exciting year ahead. Monique, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Vince. It is so amazing to finally get onto your podcast. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, the honor is mine. I am so excited to welcome you as a guest on Ultimate Guide to Partnering. You're an award-winning marketing executive, author, entrepreneur, and Microsoft's business applications partner ecosystem leader. Wow, who's that girl? <laughs> <laughs> that was a mouthful, by the way. You know, I know. I'd like to meet her one of these days. <laughs> well, it is so good to have you here today. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I am so looking to, forward to this conversation, or continuing this conversation. You and I had the chance to work together last fall in October. In fact, as you might have mentioned to me before we started, I think I dragged you to Orlando for a big conference, right? Yes, indeed. I like to tell people that Vince hustled me and my <laughs> team to participate in this pioneering event mastermind at the community summit. And, and it turns out that you had a brilliant idea. How about figuring out a way to help partners who do business with Microsoft improve their relationships and their engagements with the company and find ways to expand their business opportunities and do that in a way that is in a safe environment where they can ask the questions, where they can take a few risks and then get feedback on their strategies and, uh, and their execution plans. Brilliant. So just for the record, I didn't ask you to say that, did I? No, you did not ask <laughs> okay. me to Okay. <laughs> but thank you so much. I so appreciate you. And your team brought so much energy to that event. We're going to expand a little bit more about the business opportunity for partners here in a minute. But for our listeners who don't know you yet, can you tell us and them a little bit more about Monique Hayward? Certainly. So what's really interesting, I think, about me and my journey is that it all started with this little girl who grew up in New York City, and um, I split my childhood between there and Columbia, South Carolina. Originally, my vision for my career was to be a political reporter for the Washington Post. And I was like that specific when I was in the fifth grade. <laughs> Is that right? Even yeah, at the fifth no, I, grade? Yeah, I really wanted to be a journalist. And as you know, life unfolded and as luck would have it, I did wind up at a top 10 journalism school right outside of Washington, D.C., the University of Maryland, and where else to be besides, you know, that particular place if you wanted to be, you know, in politics and if you wanted to be in journalism. But then 
I decided that I kind of want to make some money and, and, and journalists don't really make a lot of money. It wasn't like I was, you know, sort of prescient about what would happen to the newspaper business when I was 18, 19 years old. Like, no, I just, I just had bigger and better plans for myself. And so I stuck with journalism, but I switched from newspaper to public relations And then I actually decided after that, that I really needed to get a master's in business. And so so I went to Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio to go get my MBA. And then that brought me out to Portland, Oregon, where I started my career in high technology. And I worked for a company called Tektronix. From there, I worked at tech for three years and went to Intel. And I was at Intel for 22 years. Wow. I did every job that I could possibly think of doing in the marketing space that built on my communications and marketing expertise. And the way that I like to describe my career at Intel is that I moved around to move up. And um, so I worked in every part of the business with the exception of finance, manufacturing, and sales. That was a huge education in how a company works from top to bottom. And then I switched to Microsoft. I started out in the core services engineering operations organization. And then that led me to my job currently where I am uh, working on business applications and working on ecosystem marketing, which is fantastic. I'll tell you. Well, we're going to dive in more about that career journey, but it's fascinating story. And I want to also dive in on Intel because what an amazing organization. We've learned so much from Intel. In fact, some of their leadership principles have become core to so many of the top organizations in our Right, economy. exactly. Yeah, in fact, the current CEO of Intel is a gentleman named Pat Gelsinger, and I actually worked for him as his chief of staff when he was at the company the first time around, when he was on his journey to be the uh, chief technology officer of the company. The other thing that you know I wanted to also mention about my journey is that along the way, I became an entrepreneur. And so I, I owned a restaurant business. I was a partner in a software company. And now I currently have a personal chef venture that's based down in Phoenix, Arizona. And and that's been going for, gosh, the last three and a half going on four years, which is crazy town when you think about all the other stuff that's going on in my life. What am I doing? I was a GM at Microsoft. I know what that leadership requirements are like (laughs) and the time requirements. Like, how do you do all that? I mean, that's absolutely amazing to me. Yeah. When I advise my mentees and my protégés about you know the things that they want to do with themselves and their careers, the way that I look at life is that you prioritize the things that are important to you, right? And you can always find time, right? Now, there's also a certain amount of downtime that you really should have that gives you an opportunity to think and gives you an opportunity to stretch and be creative and relax because then some of the best ideas come to you when you're in that state. You shouldn't be super scheduled and super busy and going crazy all the time. You should give yourself you know, some time to breathe. But you do have a lot of slack that you can probably take a look at that is available for you to actually prioritize and get the things done that you really want to get done, especially if they are important to your career development and your career growth as a professional. I'm fascinated here before we go on any further, because I have been practicing mindfulness. I've started a meditation practice and I'm interested. Yeah. I'm interested if you're doing anything along those lines here. Oh my goodness. I envy people who can meditate because my mind just wanders off all the time. I've tried, (laughs) but I'm in practice, shall we say on the practice of meditating because (laughs) I, I need to settle in and I need to get my, my mind calmed down. I'm sure that there are a lot of our audience members today who can relate to that constant machine, if you will, that's going on in your brain, like that, that manufacturing line, if you will, that's going on in your brain constantly, like it's always churning out something that you think is productive, right? But there are ways that I'm trying to learn uh, to slow it down and to allow myself that space to just breathe. And picking up a meditation practice for me, I think would be fantastic if I could just get my mind to settle down. Vince, how can I get my mind to settle down? I will work on this at the end of the podcast because I want to take you through a few things. But but also listen to the last episode, we well, a couple episodes ago that we did with Dr. Michael Gervais. Oh, he's yes. got some amazing practices that he's employed. 
Right. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll share some of that with our listeners as well in the show notes, but right. I wanna... Yeah, no, I, I did his, um, his high performance class actually when I first started at Microsoft. So yeah, I know he's legit. I, I love him. <laughs> he, he's amazing. And he's yeah, a great he's person. He's just amazing. a great, such a great human being. Yes. But I want to focus in on here because like I'm, we're going we're gonna to peel back on all the aspects of Monique. Yeah. But this Microsoft business, you know, this is the ultimate guide oh, to yeah. partnering and our partners care about like how to work with Microsoft. Tell us a little bit more about the partner ecosystem leader for business applications. Right. It's a big job. It is a big job. Yes. And um, we have an ecosystem that is approaching 10,000 know, companies who partner with us on business applications. And when we say business applications, we basically mean Microsoft Dynamics 365 and Power Platform. And so essentially that business process layer that is critical to the operation of any company, whether you're a small or medium business, all the way up to an enterprise concern. What I'm trying to do with my team, the big vision that I have is that I want Microsoft to be the eminent partner ecosystem for this space, for the business application space. And the way that that plays out is in four ways. The first way is we want to attract and onboard the right partners. As this business continues to grow, as there are opportunities across the board in all of these different categories, whether you're talking about customer service, whether you're talking about sales, finance, operations, uh, low code, you have an opportunity here that is once in a lifetime, once in a generation, if you will, that you're able to drive a transformation within organizations that, like I said, only comes around really once. And um, and so we want to make sure that we are attracting and onboarding the right companies in the ecosystem who share that vision around the opportunity to really go and deliver fantastic solutions for our customers. What is the yeah. right What does the right partner look like? The right partner, I think, looks like in a couple of different ways. One is certainly capable today of delivering the technology expertise that we need in order to help our customers solve their their problems, I think has to have some ambition around how they want to grow their business and use the Microsoft cloud to enable that growth for their businesses. And then also to have, you know, kind of a shared understanding about the opportunity, right? And to be thinking not just about today, but, but where are we going in the next six months, 12 months, you know, two to three years, right? This ecosystem is constantly evolving and changing. And we need partners who are not just in it to win it today, but in it to win it for the long haul. That leads me to the next uh, opportunity around this vision that we've put in place for our ecosystem partners is that we want to promote our partners' growth and success. And we do that by way of having repeatable, scalable engagements that our partners can take advantage of when doing business with Microsoft. A lot of listeners are familiar with the Microsoft Cloud Partner Program and other opportunities that we have for you to engage with us. That's the front door, if you will, to come into the Microsoft house. And, um, and that is how you know, we invest in our partner's success is to make sure that you, know, you are on board with the programs that we are putting together to, to build and grow your businesses. And then the next piece of it is to ensure that once we have the right partners on board and that we have you growing with our ecosystem, that you are doing what you need to do <laughs> to drive customer acquisition, to retain those customers in our Microsoft cloud technologies and initiatives and programs, and that they are successful in doing that. Because the storytelling that we want to be able to engage in is about how our customers are taking advantage of our platforms and building their businesses and being successful. And you as a partner are enabling that for our customers. If we are going to continue to have kind of this virtuous circle <laughs> of you know, growth and opportunity leading to success, we really need to make sure that we're focused on that piece of it. 
And then finally, you know, one of the key aspects of my role is to be the best leader that I can possibly be for the ecosystem externally, as well as for my team internally. And what we are doing is ensuring that we have a focus on a center of excellence that we are building within um, our organization to ensure that we can be the best marketers for our partner ecosystem that we can possibly be. It's highly competitive out here. I don't have to tell you that, you know, the things that keep me up at night are how am I going to ensure that I can create awareness, build brand perception, ensure that I've got great engagements and relationships and um, spend the money that I've got in the right places that are going to deliver the right results at the right time. I want to make sure that we are continuing to stay ahead of the curve and be best in class in terms of our partner marketing uh, strategies and execution. You know, it strikes me as I listen to you, you bring so much excitement and energy to this ecosystem, right? First, attracting and onboarding these partners, ensuring you're promoting their growth and success, giving them the right tools, right? In terms or the right coaching to get there. And then you being a leader in this ecosystem. I saw it live at our event. We talked about the event, (laughs) but you know, this vibrancy around this community and it's a community that's really well, I would say there's a lot of, um, it's probably one of the tightest communities is what I would say. They're really engaged with Microsoft. They seem to be the most engaged. What, why do you think that's so? You know, it's it's interesting. I'm I'm glad that you asked that question because that's one of my observations. I've only been in this role since August of 2021. And um and, and yes, I have noticed that there are lots of deep, enduring, long-lasting relationships in this ecosystem. And it doesn't take you long to get into a conversation with someone who We'll start with back in the day <laughs> and you're like, oh, wow. So I think it's I think it's a combination of the passion and the opportunity that people see in the ecosystem for the business itself. But then also going back, this is one of those businesses that Microsoft pulled together by way of a combination of acquisition as well as investment internally in growing the business. And next thing you know, you've got a multi-billion dollar business on your hands and that there are a lot of people who are associated with that from its origins all the way through to its newest instantiations of where our investment is going for the long term. And so there are people who have been on this journey since the beginning where they talk about the Great Plains days, right? Or they talk about the various acquisitions along the way. They remember the product names. They even remember the product code names for crying out loud. And you're just like, like, wow, okay. So, and that's a lot of, of institutional memory that you don't have in a lot of newer companies that Um, don't have those kind of roots that they have put in, that they have actually nurtured and grown around a a particular business category. I find that really fascinating. You've got a lot of old timers, if you will, who are also very interested, Vince, in ensuring that the business stays viable, that ensuring that it continues to grow, and that they are also very open to other companies who are potential competitors, but you know, we're all in this ecosystem and looking out for each other because it's so much better for all of these, you know, folks to work together than to view each other as a threat, right? Because the bigger business goals and Microsoft's uh, success all up is more important than what little piece of the pie that I'm going to get by competing with you head to head on this particular deal, right? I've had very few conversations with people that have centered around what's in it for me. Everybody starts with what's in it for the ecosystem, what's in it for Microsoft, and what's in it for us together as we approach these opportunities to really grow the business. I'm so excited to welcome Athletic Greens, as the latest sponsor to Ultimate Guide to Partnering. Friends who know me well know I've made taking a green drink supplement part of my health ritual for over 20 years now, and it has made all the difference to my health and well-being. 
About five years ago, I added Athletic Greens, and now their product, AG1, has become my go-to green drink supplement. I take this literally every single day. AG1 is packed with 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens. It literally has replaced every vitamin in my cabinet. I take it at the start of the day and often have a second serving on days when I really need it. If you'd like to give AG1 a try, Athletic Greens is giving away a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five travel packs with every new purchase. Check them out at athleticgreens.com forward slash Vince M. You know, I've been observing as a Microsoft leader and also with this business, and it feels like a chess game. And Microsoft is making some significant moves. I believe Microsoft is changing up the game here in terms of business applications, right? We've Microsoft has allowed Salesforce to, I'll say dominate, right? Mm -hmm. In some respects. But I've also been watching from, from my lens, A, this very vibrant ecosystem, but also how Microsoft has added functionality, integrated across the clouds with the, yep. with the solutions and some of the work. Can you talk a little bit more to our listeners about this exciting future for the business applications ecosystem at Microsoft? Yes, I can. Thank you for setting that up because one of the things that attracted me to this role was that very strategy that Microsoft, everybody knows Microsoft and everybody knows that Microsoft is pretty transparent about its strategies when we are investing in a market and when we are getting opportunities. And a lot of it has to do with, and in fact, this was very similar to what we did at Intel as well when I was at Intel. So you invest in the in the ecosystems, right? You invest in the infrastructure, you invest in the platforms, you invest, you know, because the the way that you get people to to come together around innovation is to create opportunities for multiple players across that ecosystem. It, it's a horizontal kind of approach. And people do not like silos. People do not like quote unquote getting locked in, right? Mm. <laughs> people want to have choices. And, um, and, and the way that we have invested, I think, in Microsoft from a business applications perspective is taking that kind of mentality where we want to deliver the most functionality that we can within our products, but also understanding how is that going to enable more innovation from our partners? There's always this saying that there's smarter people that are outside of an organization than there are inside of an organization, right? <laughs> and so when you create um, opportunities for people to innovate on your platform, you just get a better result, right? You just get more growth, you get more opportunity, you get more innovation. And so when you think about how we are investing in business applications, it's very much in that, in that vein, with that mindset that we continue to bring new functionality, we continue to bring more innovation, but man, we are really relying on our partners to kind of take that to the next level. Right. And to say, hey, what is it that, you know, they can do to take this platform to new horizons and to to better implement our good ideas with their good ideas to to really solve customers problems. It also strikes me from a business. Again, I talk about these chess moves. Right. And recently your organization started rolling up under a different organization. Can you share that with our listeners and what that means to the future of the platform or the integration, I would say, of the platform. So business applications is now coupled with the modern work business, which essentially is Office <laughs> 365, Teams, et cetera, which is an amazing opportunity for business applications. Because when you think about the world of modern work, when you think about hybrid work, when you think about where the future of work is going, it makes perfect sense to have modern work and business applications together under the same umbrella. The CVP who is leading the charge for us is a gentleman named Jared Spataro. He's been at, at Microsoft for, for many, many years and has been leading this business, which is a huge business, as you might imagine. I mean, talk about you know, just office alone, right? Like what that represents you know, in terms of Microsoft's revenue and, and profitability. But, but as you can see, what's been happening 
in the world of work is that processes are starting to get integrated with your everyday office applications. So when you're when you're working on Teams and you have you know, Dynamics 365 sales, you want to have the linkages between those two as a salesperson so that you're not going back and forth from one application to another, thinking more and more about, you know, where can business applications and where can modern work really interact together? From a partner standpoint, what what I've been looking at with my counterparts uh, in the modern work organization is three things. One, where can modern work partners be better with business applications? Mm. Number two, where can business applications be better with modern work, (laughs) right? And then number three, how do we get our partners more skilled, more capable, more ready to bring those opportunities together for modern work plus business applications so that they can actually have opportunities to expand their businesses and to look at it beyond just enterprise, right? We're looking at a a lot of small and medium businesses, for example, are, are already using office, teams, et cetera, right? Now, how can we actually bring them an opportunity around Central, for example, or Dynamics 365 sales, right? This just gives us a, a new way of looking at the business and, um, and creating greater value for our partners in the ecosystem and to be able to you know, create new business models that will generate more growth and more revenue for everyone in the ecosystem. I was thinking about this as you were speaking, Monique, like, what is it, 1.2 billion people use that modern work platform. Yeah. Can you say that again? 1.2 billion. billion people. And billion. Billion. With a B. Yeah. And just reimagining the future of modern work through layering in or integrating in business applications and power platform and, right. and again, I'm not paid by Microsoft here, but I just think <laughs> about that. And I look and I look at like, you know, okay, I, and I have had Salesforce here on the podcast, but just having to buy other companies and couple them together, loosely couple them, isn't going to work in the future. And I, I think there's a really interesting story here for customers and also for partners. Right. I hope that partners will, you know, take a look at this and go, wow, yes, Microsoft has really got it dialed, right? And thinking about the workflows across the business, right? The office worker of today, (laughs) right? Is not just interested in in one particular way of doing things. The pandemic taught us, right? That um, we have to be flexible. We have to think about better ways of integrating. We have to be more nimble. We have to be more agile. And we have to be quicker in terms of how we meet those needs. And if you're operating in just one context, that's not going to work. You've got to be thinking across the board. Absolutely. And so you talked about like some of the things you're doing in attracting, retaining, elevating, and enabling partners. But what do you see from the best partners you work with? (laughs) That's a great question. What I see from the best partners, the ones who are honestly our award winners every year, the ones who rise to the top, the ones who experience the most growth and and have the most um, success, I think have three characteristics. Uh, Number one, that they really understand how Microsoft works and they have the relationships, they have the connections. They tend to be in my inbox, (laughs) you know, a lot. (laughs) I I probably know some of those names too. Yes. Yeah. I bet you can call some of those names. Definitely. But, but they really understand how the machine at Microsoft works. And, and, you know, and you don't have to be a huge partner to understand that even some of my, my smaller partners really understand, right? Like how Microsoft works and, um, and whether they know that firsthand or whether somebody is coaching them to help them understand it, they, they take the time to learn how Microsoft works. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is that they are thinking about not just today's business, but what does tomorrow's business look like? Mm. They're thinking about new ways of, of making themselves indispensable to their customers. They're thinking about ways of really expanding their growth opportunities. They're they're not just resting on their laurels. And then I think the third 
characteristic of really good partners that, that I've encountered is that they press us to be better. They bring us issues, they bring us challenges, and they do it in a way that is constructive and that's respectful. And they give us the feedback and, um, and they hold us accountable for always being on point with what it is that we're trying to do to enable the business. So, so I think th- those are the three things that I think stand out for, for the ones who are the most successful. Yeah. And I want to repeat them here for our listeners, right? So they really understand how Microsoft works. Some of them might get coaching. We won't mention any names here. (laughs) Now they're working on making themselves indispensable to their customers. And we just had a recent guest on uh, who in fact focused in on how he's expanded his business and really helping being indispensable to his customers and, and their outcomes. And then they press Microsoft to be better. I see this from this community, by the way. They really do a great job. They're very vocal, yes. very deliberate, but in a diplomatic way in the way right. they approach Microsoft. Right. And they and they actually approach us in, in the spirit of collaboration, right? It's not, they don't blame us because they know we're a big organization. And there are a lot of things that happen on the inside that are beyond anyone's understanding or control, generally speaking. Right? They approach us with spirit of collaboration and the spirit of orientation, a growth mindset, you know, the things that we care about at Microsoft, right? That it's not about the people, it's about the problem, right? Let's, let's, get, that, let's get that problem solved because we'll all be better off at the end. Yeah. And so many of these partners are passionate and vested in the platform because they believe in it and oh, they yes. know it works. They know it works. Absolutely. Absolutely. Indeed. So let's pivot. I want to go back to this conversation. You know, you and I had a wonderful dinner together in Orlando. We got to share beverages and share yes. stories. And as you know, I'm fascinated with this career journey and helping yeah. others in this industry advance. Uh, so you're, you know, you're both a woman and a black woman. And I I know a little bit about the story, but I think it's so fascinating for our listeners. Can you take us through a little bit more of the details? You talked about working for Pat, who's an amazing leader, just an incredible leader from what I've been told. Yeah. But let's focus in on that path a little bit. Mm Mm-hmm. Where would you like for me to pick it up? Take me through, you know, you, you talked about doing every job except for finance, sales, and manufacturing at Intel. Tell us more about what you learned along that path and yeah. what were your key learnings? And was there a spark? Where, were, where was the spark? It looks like the spark was in fifth grade, like you deciding to be this journalist, this investigator, I'm going to call it. <laughs> yeah. are, are you an investigator of business? Is that, is that Monique? Yeah, a little bit. I think I'm, I'm pretty curious. And um, I think one of the things that has always served me well Uh, particularly in the industry that I've chosen, high technology, is that there aren't very many people like me who have the ability to communicate well and, uh, and to tell a good story and to be able to cascade that out to millions of people. (laughs) So I basically have taken the combination of that communications and marketing skill set, that briefcase, and and have kind of walked it around (laughs) throughout my career and said, who needs this skill set the most at at this particular time in this organization? And, um, And I tend to want to solve problems and bring value to teams where there needs to be more discipline and more focus around pulling a vision together, figuring out what our strategy needs to be to support that vision, putting a megaphone up against it and telling everybody and his mama what we need to be doing about it, and then being accountable and delivering the results. (laughs) And so so that has been the basic uh, framework that I have laid out for myself in my career. And that's been a really good formula for me to have been successful. The other thing too, as your listeners probably picked up on early on, is that I'm not a technology expert. I'm not an engineer. I'm not any of this. So I have built a career around being sort of successful in technology without being technical. And that's, again, back to the curiosity. I ask the questions that 
how will my mother understand this? <laughs> why does it why does this have to be so complicated? Can we please simplify it? Can we can we please just get to the three bullets that matter here and not the 20 pages that you're forcing somebody to read? So I think asking those questions, being relentless about simplification, um, being a megaphone marketer, those are the things that have been really the keys to my success as both a corporate marketing executive as well as being an entrepreneur. And I think also a lot of that entrepreneurial sense and sensibility I brought to my corporate career and vice versa, right? So being a small business owner, boy, you really do learn how to turn uh, scarcity into abundance. When you don't have a whole lot of money <laughs> to be uh, promoting your business, boy, do you figure out how to how to do some guerrilla marketing really fast in order to get customers to buy your product or your service. That's for sure. <laughs> And maybe even filling a restaurant with a bunch of friends and guests because a famous person was going to be coming. What about that story? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so so what Vince is referring to, my friends, is that I actually have the deep honor and pleasure of having Morgan Freeman, the award-winning actor, as one of my mentors in my life. And he and I met when I was still working at Intel years ago, and, and we developed a relationship out of an event that I hired him to do for me as a spokesperson when I was uh, the global diversity marketing manager at Intel. And he has been instrumental in my career, particularly when I was getting out of the restaurant business, when the great recession of 2008, 2009 happened. And I um, mean, he really did um, guide me and, and advise me through a really tough time in my career. What I remember him telling me specifically was, number one, that if I closed my restaurant business, that it would not define me for the long term. And then number two, that once I closed my restaurant business, I would be able to breathe and that my career would absolutely take off. And mm. he was right on both accounts. <laughs> so he's super wise. He is the man on screen. That gravitas is for real. And, um, and he is an amazing human being. And I love him like, uh, like a father. I just got to see Shawshank Redemption again, just oh, a wow. couple few weeks ago. And just what an amazing performance by him. I know he's a, he's an amazing, just an amazing man. Uh, he's an actor. He's a, he's a humanitarian. He's a philanthropist. He's, He's, you know, mentor to Monique Hayward. I mean, he's, he's yes. like everything. <laughs> We're going to have to get you both here on the podcast next. That's yeah, a, That would be awesome. You know, you said something and I don't want to leave it without amplifying it for our listeners because actually I learned something here. What you said was you brought Monique and her toolkit to each of those individual jobs and all these different departments of a company. I always felt like you had a morph, like you had, if you were moving to some other role, you know, HR is an example, like you couldn't be that same person, but you said, yes, I find the organizations that need Monique, they need that toolkit. And this is what I bring simplification, amplification, you know, all those things that you bring that are unique to you, you bring that to the job. Yeah. Yeah. And with some, with some opportunity to uh, expand the skill set for sure. I, I learn something every time I do um, a, a particular role or have more responsibility, especially as I've become a senior leader in organizations, right? Um, the leadership journey has been, you know, quite, you know, quite enriching and, and quite engaging, but the basic skill set is still the same. <laughs> <laughs> this is a favorite question. And, you know, since you have a catering business, you might, you might find this one interesting. Okay. Monique. So you're hosting a dinner party. I'd be interested to know what's on the menu since you have a catering business, but you can invite any three guests from the present or the past to this dinner party. Whom would you invite and why? Okay. Well, first of all, so I would invite um, Frederick Douglass because he's an amazing orator and storyteller. And I think that my guests would be absolutely fascinated with his journey through history. Barack Obama, because he's like just an amazing human being. Again, first black president of the United States. I mean, everybody knows his story, but I'm sure that he has 
some really interesting anecdotes that he would tell in a smaller setting rather than in a public forum. I would, of course, invite my mother because she can't miss that for the world. And, um, and I think the last person that I would invite would be, um, would be Oprah. Oprah Winfrey, because Ah. she would just, she would keep everybody kind of like relaxed and on point and inject her, you know, sort of soulfulness and mindfulness into the, into the operation. So that would be awesome. I I love it. What a great conversation this would be. Frederick Douglass, uh, Barack Obama, your mom and Oprah. I mean, what a great group. Can I I come, maybe I can come by for a beverage afterwards. What do you think? Absolutely. Yes. (laughs) So, Monique, you have been an amazing guest. Well, thank I, you. You bring so much energy to life, and I'd re- I really appreciate that about you. Well, thank and you. And I appreciate I you appreciate, making the time. I appreciate you. Thank you for inviting me onto the podcast. Um, I hope that the listeners found it intriguing and interesting. I would well, really I, love to know. <laughs> well, we'll find. We're going to ask them. But first, yeah, I have one. Them. I have one more. I have one more question for you. Okay. Right? For for all of them. What advice would you give to each of us and to them to set us up for success in 2023? Oh, wow. I think in 2023, boy, the world is an interesting place. So my advice would be uh, to ensure that you have a fantastic plan, but make sure that it's flexible enough to change on the fly. Number two, um, make sure that you're resourced to do the things that you want to to do because this is an era where we are kind of doing more with less and um, you don't want to be in a position where you're doing less with less. <laughs> right? mm. So so ensure that you've got the resources to, to be able to achieve your objectives uh, this year. And then I think the third thing is, is to just have some fun. It's going to be tough. It's going to be crazy. It's, it, there are all kinds of world events, macroeconomic conditions, all these things that you know, are pointing in the direction of things being a little rocky. But you know what? Be optimistic. Have a good time. Find some joy in all of this and, uh, and do it for yourself as well as for your teams because everybody needs to stay the course this year and, um, and feel like they are making a contribution and being productive in the process. You know, I am extremely optimistic. I, I have, maybe I have rose colored glasses on, but I feel that we in this technology sector have such an opportunity to help lead, lead the change. Yes. And that even during, you know, economically challenging times, people still need to reinvent their businesses. And That's right. Preach it, Vince. Preach. I am there with you, you know, yes. and I, I am so excited for the future for all of us, Monique. Yes, I am too. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm going to put a plug in. I'm going to be speaking at your event coming up here. I think it's going to be the 24th of this month, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, we're going to have you as our featured speaker for the uh, Business Applications Partner Hour. I love it. I can't wait to join you up on stage again. I'm so excited. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you. So there you have it. Another amazing guest joins Ultimate Guide to Partnering. And I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Odds are, if you're a technology partner executive and hearing my voice, chances are you too are looking to accelerate your success through partnerships. I mean, let's face it. We all have seen partnerships that look good on paper, but never live up to their expected results. There are a lot of reasons why partnerships fail. And at Ultimate Partnerships, We help you get it right by applying a proven set of best practices and framework that's used by leading partners working with Microsoft and other technology giants. If you want to learn more, follow the link in the show notes or visit our website at ultimateguidetopartnering.com. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Ultimate Guide to Partnering with your host, Vince Minzione. Online at ultimateguidetopartnering.com and facebook.com slash ultimateguidetopartnering. We'll catch you next time on The Ultimate Guide to Partnering.